14 seconds. Uh, talk amongst yourselves. You've got 14 seconds. Um, Do you think it's okay? Yeah? Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so, just to welcome everyone to my session today. Um, it's on compensating transactions for the cloud. Um, my name's Tom Jenkinson. I'm the project lead of an open source project called uh, Nariana. Um, it's a transaction manager suite of uh, tooling to support building transactional applications. Um, people might be familiar with our work in um, Wildfly, where we provide a JTA implementation, um, which is a Java EE specification, probably all quite familiar with it. Um, so I've been leading the project for a few years now, I've got some of my colleagues on the team here today. Um, so in particular today though, I'm going to um, discuss um, a newer topic, so slightly different to what people are more familiar with uh, our work from, and that's um, the use of a compensating transaction um, and how it can be suitable for um, cloud-based applications. Um, so I'm going to go into a bit about the motivation for this, why you might be interested to do this in the first place, um, and then I'm going to talk more about how um, we worked through establishing some of the requirements for what a cloud-based transaction manager might mean. Um, and I'm going to move on to a live coding demo, which uh, started working as of 15 minutes ago. So it was, uh, hopefully it'll work now. <laughs> um, and then just wrap up with some conclusions. Uh, anyone that um, wants to ask questions, just put your hand up, but otherwise we're going to do them at the end. Um, so the motivation for why we need to start looking at the need for transactions in the first place and um, in particular in, in a cloud environment. Um, I don't think anyone in this room will be able to um, sort of object to the point that systems do fail. It's kind of, you know, there'll be very few people that have never had a, a machine crash on them. Um, and we do see, obviously, over time, the, the reliability of the individual components, like the hardware or the software, gets better um, generationally. Um, but even as like the in individual incident of failure might reduce, when you're running under scale, um, so where you've got like a cloud environment, for example, even just a, a relative mm. a drop in the um, incidence of failure can be amplified by the sheer number of nodes that can go wrong. So further motivation for being interested in this topic um, is that, um, as we know, debugging a problem on your machine can be tricky, but obviously in a sort of cloud or maybe let's say microservices environment where you have like many uh, machines involved, that distributed system classical problem um, is just you know, further amplified. So, you know, there is a need to look at sort of fault tolerance of your software um, and um, what we are saying is that a transaction can be part of your toolkit when you approach this, like, whole topic. Um, in microservices, obviously, we've got a number of um, uh, tools available to us. People use things like circuit breakers and retries, health check, all stuff to try to keep the liveness of the application. Um, we see transactions fitting within that in an air, uh, within that space, uh, not to replace those things, but to complement them. Um, our particular um, value towards that is that um, the transaction helps to ensure the correctness of a system so um, not so much to uh, when failures have happened, but more to try to m prevent the incident of failure in the first place. 
So when we talk about correctness, I'm really talking about transitioning your application in a managed way from one known state to a second state where it's affected multiple um, entities within the system and safely transitioning it from between those two states. Um, it, um, the transactions um, that you probably would be familiar with, uh, the, there are many models. Um, JTA is only an XA or only one of them. But um, typically, transactions have these four properties that you can kind of select from. And that graphic on, on the right there is just to show that, you know, you can see with that um, alchemy going on that you don't have to have a complete, in, a full ingredient in, a, in a every um, sort of axis here. So you don't have to have complete atomicity in order for it to be a transactional model. So JTA is a full acid model. So you take all four of those properties and take you know, the extreme of all of those. So, but other models will relax some of those particular um, elements um, to get uh, other benefits that I'll come on to in the subsequent slides. But just briefly, to, for people that aren't, maybe aren't as familiar, when we talk about acid, we talk about the four properties. So atomicity basically means that all or nothing of, let's say, two resources, they both do something or neither do something. Consistency is um, about how um, an external party to the system is only made aware of those two updates um, at the same time um, in a strongly consistent situation. Um, and isolation relates quite, quite strongly to that consistency in it, in it defines better what can, whether intermediary states can be seen outside of even a transaction. And durability relates to basically whether um, power loss will affect the overall system. So, you know, it's important to appreciate those four elements, but I'm just going to walk through the four of them now in a little bit more depth to um, talk about how when we look on the transactions in the cloud, um, we can look at some of the um, sort of nuances of that deployment environment and work out what we might be able to do to relax some of those properties to build a model that's more suited for it. So when we're looking at cloud and microservices, we can say that there um, potentially are many more parties involved in those transactions than we might be used to with, say, the monolith, where you might have like a customer manager and an and a order management system, and those might be the two elements involved. With microservices, you'll have obviously decompose that much, much further, and thereby increase the number of parties involved. Um, we might see it going to other organizations, probably not in, um, like what I mean by that is a relationship be between, say, a travel company and an individual supplier to that travel company. You might see the transaction spanning between those two entities, but that isn't really typical to um, microservices to couple those two things together. But in a cloud environment, you might see participation between the different um, organizations that you want to keep a little bit of a track on. Um, the other thing about microservices and cloud-based interactions that's a little bit different to normal JTA transactions is that we'll expect these transactions to maybe last a much longer period of time. Um, so, you know, if we say that full acid transactions could help us to ensure that correctness in theory, when taken into account the um, restrictions that are present in, in these environments, we need to look at what we can actually do to um, relax in those four properties in order to build a model that fits these requirements as well. So um, the two main things that we consider when, when doing uh, the selection of the properties is about whether or not individual services can block each other, uh, which basically means that um, you, know, you could maybe lock a say, a customer database um, until you can also unlock the um, order database. Well, obviously, with microservices, we're not talking about doing that. So um, 
given those things, we can you know, safely assume that full acid isn't actually going to work optimally in that environment. Um, so what can we actually do in terms of uh, relaxing these properties? I'm going to work through an example here. Um, when I take each property, I just want you to kind of con uh, consider the situation where we're going to book a seat on a plane and we're going to purchase some travel insurance. And, you know, historically you might have said we want to do both of those things um, if you were building like a monolith. But maybe we're saying in a microservices, is there something we can do where we don't have to lock both the travel insurance database and the seat booking database? So that first property of atomicity, um, when we look at what, um, what atomicity is and how it can be um, relaxed, um, in the example, uh, I'll go straight to that particular point, um, that when relaxing atomicity in this circumstance, what we'll be talking about is potentially allowing someone to book a seat on a plane, but being less um, concerned that they then couldn't subsequently book the travel insurance at the same time, because, you know, they might say, okay, well, I'm going to try and take the I know I need to fly to, um, say, Austria, um, but I can, might be able to pick up my travel insurance elsewhere if I can't buy it from the flight company. So ideally, I either buy the uh, flight insurance, uh, the, the flight seat, and the travel insurance, or just the flight seat. But I definitely don't want to just buy the travel insurance. So that would be an example of relaxing atomicity. Um, that's something that we can consider when, when de deciding a model that we don't need to have access to full atomicity from this outcome. Um, the technique that um, you can use to achieve that with standard transactions is something called nested transactions. We don't see the use of that in, in um, normal uh, XA two-phase commit scenarios, but it doesn't mean to say that that doesn't exist and that's something that you know, come on to that we can actually utilize in this particular um, environment. The next property that we can look at relaxing consistency. I did mention that ACID transactions have this sort of intrinsic expectation of strong consistency um, whereby the resources involved in a transaction move in lockstep between the two states that you wanted the prior transaction and the after transaction state. Um, so, you know, given that acid expect, uh, full acid would expect that, um, there's obviously been a lot of research on that over the years, and it's been well acknowledged, something that probably most people here are familiar with, of a technique called eventual consistency, whereby that can be, um, uh, you know, depending on the application, that can be a totally viable um, option, and there's a lot of research into it to show um, that the, the, the scaling improvements that are possible via eventual consistency, you know, can outweigh some of the drawbacks, and, and uh, we see that as another area where a transaction model that's developed for the cloud and microservices, you know, can, can potentially make some uh, headway. Um, just to help in your mind conceptualize what that um, eventual consistency would, would be, um, what the impact of it would be to your application. Um, we're basically saying that, you know, if you are able to book the airline seat and the travel insurance, but at certain points in time, only one or the other is visible, is that going to be a problem for your application? And, you know, we would say that quite frequently in these kind of situations, that isn't going to be an actual problem. It's not going to stop. Um, you know, KLM's business if for a moment one of the seats is showing as booked and the travel insurance isn't, for example. So, um, you know, it's something that the mo so long as the model eventually ensures that the seat and the um, insurance is taken or neither is, if in the meantime those two, those, uh, you know, those don't reconcile externally, you know, that isn't necessarily going to be a problem. And again, related, it, we do have isolation. Um, so um, in this circumstance, it's talking about being able to see, for example, that seat was booked um, for 
participate for actors in a system that might even not be transactional aware. But again, how much of an impact is it if someone can't get the ticket for a, a potentially a period of time for a transaction that subsequently doesn't complete? Again, when you're talking about scale, it hopefully wouldn't have a huge uh, negative effect on your, your application. Um, and then the final property is durability. I'll not, I'll not particularly talk about this too much because although relaxing durability is appropriate in certain circumstances, um, for instance, in Narayana, we have a part of our toolkit is a software transactional memory implementation where durability may or may not make sense. For most business interactions, durability is going to be important. So in the example, if we had a power failure after booking a travel ticket and then subsequently didn't take the travel insurance, that wouldn't you know, be correct for most systems. So when we're looking at this transaction model, we didn't really consider relaxing durability beyond that. So how did we actually go ahead and, um, you know, given that sort of theory, how did we uh, arrive at um, any kind of solutions? Well, we worked with a community called MicroProfile, which hopefully some of you in the audience are familiar with. Um, it's, um, it's, you know, it's not just Red Hat that are involved in it, there are other people as well. And um, it's, it's not like, um, it, it uses some Java uh, EE specifications like CDI within it, but um, there are other specifications as well. And um, so we worked with that community um, to try to establish what they thought would be suitable for a microservices, a Java microservices uh, transaction model. Um, so we obviously had the backing of that knowledge about the properties, but what we did is we explored with them some just general use cases for cloud environment. Um, to sort of try to work out where transactions can be can be utilised, where an API that can standardise the interaction between these Java components in a microservices environment can make sense. Uh, so we primarily looked at uh, things like booking tickets, uh, booking trips, such as like a hotel and a taxi and a flight. That's a pretty classic transactions example. Um, it became apparent, if, if we didn't already consciously accept or not, I'm not sure, but you know, it quickly became apparent that scalability is one of the main things that we need to look at. And with transaction models, the, the isolation um, property is mainly enforced via locking, and that, as we mentioned, has a real impact on scalability. You know, if you have to lock a database for a long period of time in order to achieve a transactional outcome, um, it reduces the throughput and the overall system because different uh, clients can't uh, progress their transactions in parallel. So we knew that would be a requirement uh, that we'd need to address. So what we ended up with was uh, an API called Long Run in Actions. Um, well, when I say ended up, it's not a final uh, draft. Uh, it's not a final specification. So one of the really, you know, great things I'd like to see from the talk today is just anyone that you know does have an interest in this to sort of get involved in the community and try to really work with us on on what would be, um, you know, more suitable potentially than than long running actions. Um, but. Um, the current product of that work is a draft specification called Long Running Actions. And basically, it's just a Java API that allows you to um, coordinate uh, transactional activity, um, which is suitable for doing things that have a long duration and the uh, individual participants in the transaction are, are loosely coupled in that their availability of one shouldn't impact the availability of another process. We've got um, CDI annotations, a Java API, and I'll show you that in the demo. Um, we've had questions about the async um, nature of the API, and that's something that we're working on because uh, we had some comments recently from people that are familiar with, more familiar with reactive languages, and at the moment, you know, we need to work, work on this area. 
Uh, but at the moment, I should say, we really want to concentrate on getting this model proven by the wider community before we start looking at async in detail. Uh, the general philosophy of the API is to build in this concept of like a, a compensation, basically, so that you can do work and have a callback to actually undo the work that you've done and be reliably informed if that, if that is necessary. Um, it puts some responsibility on the service implementer because these compensation handlers do need to be idempotent, which is not necessarily the, um, you know, the uh, most complex of work, but it's not necessarily easy either. So it is a requirement on, on the services themselves that when, when they're told to undo their work, that they can be repeatedly told that same command and not. You know, if it was like, if the compensation of a bank transaction was to credit an account with, say, you know, uh, 10 euros or something, if it's repeatedly called this compensation action, you don't want to, you know, credit repeatedly. So they do, do have to be idempotent, but, you know, there are techniques to do that. So we don't see it as particularly uh, burdensome. It's just to be conscious of it. Um, so you just got one overall sequence diagram showing it, all the actors in a system, uh, in the system that we would see in a long-running action system. You got the client on the left there, the long-running action, which is the transaction coordinator, really, um, a microservice, for instance, a flight booking system, and uh, its transactional uh, element backed by a data store. Um, and these are just the several interactions that you might expect where you would enlist with a transaction and, and eventually have a complete method called on the participant. Um, the slides are available later, so just generally to be aware of this concept of a, a client, a transaction, and a microservice, really. And the fact it's probably got a data backend. Um, so with that said, I'll now move over to the live coding demo. Uh, before I... Um, do that. I'll just introduce some of the technology that's used in the demo. Um, we've got OpenShift, which um, fingers crossed is going to work. Um, we've got Swarm in here, and we've obviously got Mariana. So I think everyone in the room is probably familiar with most of those. Uh, OpenShift is pretty much Kubernetes with many additional usability improvements on top, but it's, it's a cloud container platform. Uh, Swarm is the Java application server, but where you can right size your war into something that's, uh, you know, you don't deploy your war into the application, you just package it up and you can run it with Java minus jar. And then Ariana is our transaction toolkit. And this is the demo that I'm going to show you. Um, so the states that we're talking about, um, we've obviously got the initial state where uh, nothing's booked. And we're going to go through a system whereby we book a hotel, uh, book a first class flight, book an economy flight. Having known that we can book the economy flight, we release the first class flight. And then we ask the transaction manager to complete the work that remains. So in this case, it would be to actually confirm the economy flight and confirm the hotel. So, you know, I think, I think it's... A, fairly good example in the sense of we can all imagine going on a website and trying to do this ourselves and how it would be useful to ensure that you don't end up with a flight to somewhere where you haven't got the hotel or, or vice versa. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of idea. Um, what you'll notice is I'm going to use a nested long running action to give me this sort of relaxed atomicity, which allows me to confirm both flights but then subsequently release the first class flight. So that's kind of relaxed atomicity there. Um, and um, we're also going to see, well, it's not going to be too, it might not be that clear about the relaxed isolation, but effectively by booking those two flights and those being visible to other clients, we've relaxed isolation. Um, and we're also going to be eventually consistent just by nature of using the long run in action because the confirmation handlers, you know, can be called. We're not going to simulate a crash where that happened, but potentially 
you know, a failure between the um, confirming of the economy flight and the confirming of the hotel, once the transaction manager had been told to close, um, you know, it would eventually, those two things would happen. But we might not see, you know, in this demo, I'm not going to crash it at that point, but that is relaxed consistency. Um, so I'll go over to the IDE now. Okay, so uh, so the, the system is built with a few utility classes. It revolves around the premise of this, this booking object that's going to be common to all of the, um, the microservices, the three microservices, the hotel microservice, the flight microservice, and the overall trip booking system. They're all going to have the same notion of what a booking is, so you'll see this class floating around. Um, obviously, if it was different companies, it wouldn't be the same data. It's just a convenience. It, it serializes to JSON again for convenience. Um, the mm, second and final utility class we'll just have a quick look at is I've written what I hasten to add isn't a production grade database, it is a hash map, but it simulates a data store. Um, so if you recall back to that sequence diagram, it's the data store component on the far right. It's not the microservice. It's just a place where we can store data. Um, so let's take a look at the hotel microservice. So this is, um, what, I, what I've done is I've prepared what might be close to an existing microservice that isn't using transactions. And all I'm going to do for expediency is add transactions to an existing class. But it, it's not a particularly complicated class. So I'm not, you know, just, I haven't got time to write the whole thing. So it pretty much resolves, revolves around this reserve method, basically. So this is um, accessed, you know, via Jack's RS service. And what it does is it basically creates a booking and adds it to the store. But obviously, if there are failures involved in the overall interaction, you know, the, the programmer will be responsible for reconciling that data themselves. And so what we're going to use is long-running actions to make it so that a, a third-party coordination framework can just reconcile this for them uh, using some fairly, from, fairly um, uh, intuitive languages. So in order to make it so that we can add long-running action to this, the first thing that we need to do is update its build system to pull in Nariana. Um, so um, it's quite a small POM. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. As I say, it's on, it's on uh, GitHub. But um, it's obviously built using Swarm. And what I've got here is I've got... Um, my, my application has got access to MicroProfile Swarm for action to get all the Jax RS things. Um, but I'm now just going to add in the Nariana uh, uh, capability as well into the class path. So, you know, that would be the first thing that you would do as a programmer is add that in. And given that, then your microservice, your hotel microservice now, could just add an annotation to it at LRA. So, for those of you that are familiar with Java EE, which um, I'm going to assume pretty much everyone, um, LRA is kind of a close analog to something like CMT in the way that it's going to work in this in this in this situation. It's not going to have the same uh, transactional properties, but it basically defines the scoping of a transaction. So in the same way that at transactional would. Um, so when you have access to an LRA, you know you can see things like you might be familiar with from transactional. So it's required or it requires me or mandatory. Again, this isn't talking about anything to do with locking isolation or anything like that. It's just a scoping of the transactions going to be held by, by those properties. So when we do the reserve, 
all we need to do, obviously, um, in a full system, you might not write it quite this way, but the, the um, ID of the booking, um, I'm going to make it match the transaction ID, um, just for convenience, because um, as we'll see shortly, we need some way to reference that booking. Um, we need some way to uh, reference the same booking during uh, the handlers. So now the, uh, the booking has a, a viable ID that we can use in the completion and the compensation handlers. Um, we also provide a JAXRS method to get access to its business logic, so I'm not going to show you <coughs> too much here. Uh, so the completion method, so this is what the coordinator will call if the transaction is asked to commit. So when I created the in initial booking, I decided to create it in a state called provisional. Some people might create it immediately confirmed, just to show that the, the capabilities that are available. I'm going to transition it to a status of confirmed in a business logic sense during the completion handler. That might be a no-op is what I'm trying to say for some people. Um, so in order to make this so that it's available to the uh, transaction framework, I just need to mount it on a path. and just add one annotation of complete. So that makes it of when, when that, LR, that at LRA annotation was first encountered, we, the Narayana framework registered with the coordinator, the endpoint for this JAXRS service, uh, effectively so the coordinator can inc invoke this particular method and uh, it could be called anything, so the way that the framework recognises it is via that annotation. In the same way, I've already written these two out because it's more or less the same thing, but there's a, there's a compensated variant as well. So this service is now fully compliant with LRA and can be compensated and confirmed. So when we look at the flight microservice, I've pretty much just already copy-pasted it in here, but what I want to show particular with this one, it's, it's exactly the same as the other one, apart from, if you recall, I wanted an ability to get a, a not complete atomic outcome, so I wanted to be able to cancel one of these. So in order to do that, the first thing I needed, well, will need to do, for this at LRA method that does the reserving, I want to just mark it as a nested LRA. So that means that when we, the framework encounters that this is scoped by an LRA that notes as well that it's a nested one, it'll try to register within an encompassing transaction if one already exists rather than create a new one or, or try to merge them somehow. So this note, the framework therefore knows that it needs to be nested. Um, so the other thing that um, happen, we need to do in here then is this was written from the point of view that um, it was prior to transaction, so the cancel capability was rawly implemented by just transitioning the state to cancel. But what we can also do to get a better transactional outcome is we can inject a class called LRA client which for people familiar with Java EE will be able to see a close analog with the API that we've got here with user transaction. So you can start and cancel them, which is kind of like beginning and committing and rolling back. Um, but what we're, so what we're gonna do here is rather than just straight up uh, cancel it, we're gonna just use that LRA client to cancel it. And um, as I mentioned before, 
the fact that we're using the uh, transaction ID um, as the booking ID means that um, you know that information propagates nicely through. Um, you could have a mapping table somewhere if you didn't want to pollute your database with transaction IDs. So at the end of cancel LRA call, um, I'm still going to do the same after that and return these status. But obviously, this thing hasn't directly invoked to transition the state to cancelled. Uh, it's going to cancel this nested LRA, which ends up with the coordinator calling the compensate method. Um, so the final class that we'll look at is the trip, which coordinates the entire thing. Um, so this, this method here is kind of like the main part of it, really. Um, and it kind of encapsulates what that sequence diagram was doing around transition in the states of the particular booking. So we're going to book the hotel, book the first class, book the economy flight, um, and then we're going to cancel the first class flight and then return to the client in order that they might then complete or cancel the entire booking. Um, so in order to do that, again, we're going to mark this as an LRA. But what I don't want to do here, uh, I don't want at the end of this call for this transaction to immediately commit uh, close. Uh, so, so I mark it so that it basically leaves it open so that business logic can be called again. And I also want to say that I don't, this thing isn't actually a participant. It might want to be, it probably would make sense for it, but just to show the capability, this thing's demarcating the transaction, but it's not actually going to participate in the transaction itself. Um, so we're going to use a header param again. Um, So the booking ID, and then um, the business, the, the client can subsequently choose to confirm or cancel the booking. This is business logic confirm and cancel, not LRA terminology. So uh, what we're going to do in that circumstance is use the LRA client that I've already injected in to just, in the case of confirm, I'm just going to close the LRA. And in terms of the cancel, I'm just going to cancel it. So I've seen that we've not got too much time left. So I have already got, but that is the example fully complete. So if you look at, if you go to the source code, the, there's two commits. There's it without, with, without transactions and it with transactions. And if you inspect it, you'll see you're talking about 20 lines of code maybe to get a lot of transactional benefit. Um, so I'm just going to quickly fire it all up and hope for the best. So um, I'm going to start up the, a process that can host the main coordinator, a process that can host the subordinate, the nested transactions. Um, they could be the same process, of course. What I'm trying to capture here is that these transactions aren't necessarily all hosted in one process. There's not a single point of failure. Although an individual transaction has state, the cluster of transaction managers you know, can handle multiple transactions at the same time. Um, and then we've got the hotel service, the flight service, and the trip service. Um, and then we just need to curl some endpoints. So, uh, so we're just going to post to this guy at the bottom here to start the whole building of the um, uh, booking. Um, so what you're seeing here is that you've got a provisional overall trip, a uh, provisional hotel booking, so that's the sort of main atomic part of the outcome. You've got a cancelled first class flight and a confirmed economy flight. And we'll just, um, as I was saying, we're going to use the um, 
booking ID, uh, transaction ID for the booking ID. So we're just going to transition this particular transaction ID to confirm the rest of the items. So that's going to basically just going to move those two provisional items to fully confirmed at the top here. So as you can see now, the, the overall booking is confirmed and the hotel is also confirmed. Um, I have it running on mini shift. Um, I think I've got a few minutes. Um, so um, with mini shift. Uh, I've already deployed all the services, as I say, uh, but what I want to do is just uh, show you something about the durability side of things. Um, so there's the five services deployed here, and again, this, the, the repo will deploy all this for you. There's a script to deploy it. Um, the coordinators are all backed by storage. Um, so the main LRA process, so the one that sort of was up here before, uh, has one set of logs, the sort of one that had the nested uh, has its own set of logs, I've called it Flight LRA Coordinator. You know, they could be the same logs, could be the same process, could be different ones, it doesn't matter really. Um, but uh, they do need stable storage. Some, it's quite important to know because you are talking about something that is inherently stateful in terms of the individual, co in, individual coordinator. So it is, a, is something to research to understand the implications of that in these types of environments. But let's just... Uh, Go to the actual um, overview, get the link for the trip, which was the one that uh, basically was the one that was down here that we hit with the puts. Uh, get a copy of the URL. And go back to the. So we're going to curl x post to layer. And I'm going to push it through a JSON visualizer. Um, see what happens. Okay, uh, so that did work, which is good. Um, again, provisional, provisional, cancelled, confirmed. Uh, I'm going to bounce the LRA coordinator. Just going to simulate that with a deploy. And then while that's happening in the background, I'm just going to get a copy of the URL of the ID. And I'm going to curl minus x put uh, and that should still work. Um, so those are still cancelled and confirmed at the bottom there, but somewhere around here we should see that the first two are now also confirmed, which is good. That's excellent, it's all worked, and I think that's it. <laughs> so if there are any questions, uh, or I'm around all day as well, so I'll be probably stood out there in, for an hour, so yeah. Okay, well, thanks. Oh. I just had one question. Yeah. Uh, when you did the uh, removal of the cancellation calls to move it away from the uh, yeah. I think cancel call, you put it into the compensation, yeah. which is triggered through the LRA, yeah. I understand. Yeah. That does the cancellation? Yeah. So, um, so that's what I wasn't sure yeah. because it was too long. And yeah, sure. The, the cancel was originally implemented. Oh, um, so the question was um, when uh, I did the business logic change from the cancel uh, JAX RS endpoint to move it to using the LRA coordinator, did that immediately cancel the um, uh, booking? And I was answering it in a sense to say, yes, it, it did do that, but basically 
I moved it from a hard-coded cancel to write into the database of cancelled to call the coordinator to do that on its behalf reliably. In the circumstance I showed it there where there was only one thing getting updated, it's probably not too problematic to transition it within that business logic and if you've got an error the person might just retry you themselves. But if you had something slightly more complicated that you wanted to do during a cancel that might maybe call two other systems, then it's more beneficial to run that cancellation through this framework. Um, you know, and this framework could then do the retries for you, or the retry system can reliably do the retries of those multiple services. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so if, if there aren't any more questions, just let's say thank you for attending and uh, see you around. <laughs>
there's inside there's the there's the much or you can say that in Czech, right? So and uh, this is not holding, so you need the guma. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. And uh, USB, USB is here if someone needs to transfer uh, some slides or anything to different computers. This, uh, and um, yeah, that's all you need to know. And this is water for speakers or for you, whatever. It's like I brought this here. Yes. So, so don't use the computer here. Uh, 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 speaker has to bring her own auto. Own what? Uh, have to use own auto. Yes. Well, if it works. If, um, if, if, if it if works, not, uh, if not, then my, if, my if laptop or, uh, yeah, so someone put here. Don't use. No, this we don't use. This. There's no none of this stuff. So okay, sure. someone from the audience, okay? Yeah, cool. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. One, one quick question. Uh, basically, uh, our microservice like, uh, handles uh, if downstream, downstream system is down. Yeah. Uh, and what happens if we have confirmed uh, tickets? Yeah. But uh, we were unable to confirm other because our application server crashed. Yeah. How do we solve it?